Hello everybody and welcome to today's webinar, Understanding US FDA Regulatory Responsibilities for Cell Therapy Companies, hosted in partnership with Buchanan, Ingersoll and Rooney PC. I am Georgie Makin, the editor at Facilitate, and today I am joined by a great pair of speakers who will shortly be introduced to you. But before we get started, I just wanted to take a second to run through a little bit of housekeeping. First of all, I would just like to remind you that the final portion of this session is reserved for an interactive Q&A discussion. So please do submit your questions via the Q&A widget accessible via the bottom of your screen. We will also attempt to answer your questions offline should we run out of time. This session is being recorded and will be available on demand shortly after the conclusion of the event. Details for on-demand viewing will be sent to you once the recording is available. So without further ado, I would like to introduce you to Barbara Binzak Blumenfeld and Tina Hu. I will now hand over to Barbara to start today's discussion. Great, thank you so much. So I'm pleased to be here today. I am Barbara Binzak Blumenfeld. I am a shareholder in the FDA and Biotechnology Practice Group at Buchanan Ingersoll and Rooney Law Firm based in Washington, DC. I, before law school, decided I was going to originally be a career scientist, so I obtained my PhD in molecular biology, but then decided I was very interested in legal, regulatory, and policy issues, so I decided to go to law school, and I have, for the past 18 years, been helping clients strategize about the regulatory options for any type of product regulated by FDA, including in recent years, cell therapy products. So Tina, would you please introduce yourself? Sure, I'll keep it brief because I am not the, the main course today. My name is Tina Hu Rogers, and I am a counsel in the FDA regulatory group at Buchanan Ingersoll and Rooney. I work very closely with Barbara on many of the issues that she discussed. Um, if FDA touches it, we deal with it. And um, today I am just here to support Barbara as she walks through the different FDA regulatory responsibilities for cell therapy companies. Um, and I will be here to um, field any questions that you guys may have. Uh, Georgie mentioned that there would be some time afterwards for questions, and that's true, but we also do want this to be slightly interactive. So to the extent that you know Barbara says something that you have a question about, please feel free to enter the questions in the Q&A box and I will do my best to uh, pay attention to that and get those questions answered for you guys. And then without further ado, I am going to pop off camera uh, so that you guys can focus on Barbara and um, let her get started. Great, thank you, Tina. So yes, as Tina said, without further ado, let me first of all outline some of the key topics that I'd like to cover today and hopefully I will get your questions on. I'm going to start by looking at the cell product regulatory categories and how FDA has traditionally enforced those regulations for cell therapy products. I'm also going to talk about the cell product approval requirements. And then as we get further on in the discussion today, I'd like to offer my comments on how you can avoid common regulatory pitfalls with the US FDA. And then finally, we'll wrap up by talking about the importance of an FDA regulatory plan. And what I'll be doing actually throughout the presentation is offering some thoughts on what I think are the key reasons that it is very critical that any company that is working in the cell therapy space have an FDA regulatory plan in hand. So with that, Let's start talking about these regulatory categories and FDA enforcement. And this brings me to the first reason why I think it's important that you have a regulatory plan in hand as you pursue your project. And that's to really understand the regulatory requirements for your cell therapy product. As I think you'll see in a moment, the regulations in the US are quite complicated and therefore thinking through these sorts of issues in advance can be a very great uh, strategic opportunity for your company. So the basis for cell regulation in the US, it's obviously, as I said, quite complicated, but I've tried to boil it down here into a few key points. The first one is that in the US, cell therapy products are considered to be human cells 
tissues and cellular and tissue-based products. So this is a categorization that FDA has created called HCTPs, which is, I guess, only a bit more easy to say than the full uh, acronym spelled out. But HCTPs encompasses a broad range of cellular and tissue products. But the important point is that HCTPs, as defined by FDA, contain or consist of human cells or tissues that are intended to be transplanted, implanted, infused, or transferred into a human recipient. So that's the first important point. They're human cells going into another human recipient. So for instance, if you are a company interested in xenotransplantation or interspecies use of cells, then those are outside of the scope of these HCTPs. The regulation here in the US is rooted in a couple of key acts. And these are the acts that give FDA the authority to regulate products as it does. The first is the Public Health Service Act. So the PHS Act is primarily uh, devoted towards the um, controlling the risk of communicable diseases. In, in within the country. The second is the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. And this act gives FDA the remainder of its authorities over everything from drugs and medical devices to biologics and cell products. And of course, the statutes can be somewhat vague at times. So FDA implements regulations that further define and provide more clarity on all of these requirements. But the key point to remember that hopefully will um, be obvious as we go through the next few slides is that the extent of the regulation that FDA exerts over these products is based on the product's communicable disease risk to the recipient. So low level of regulation means there's a low level that the recipient is going to perhaps have a communicable disease transmitted to them by receiving the cells. The higher the level of regulation, the more likely there would be an opportunity to introduce some kind of uh, communicable disease agent. So that forms really the backdrop of how we regulate cell therapy in the US. What I've tried to do is take a very complex area and boil it down to uh, a decision tree of sorts. So when you're thinking about how your cell therapy is regulated, the first question you need to ask yourself is whether or not you meet one of six particular regulatory exceptions in FDA's regulations. Now, there are these six very well-defined instances when FDA says, if you fall in one of these categories, we are not going to regulate your product. So if you can answer yes, that you meet one of those exceptions, you do not have to be concerned about FDA oversight. However, those are generally very narrow exceptions. So let's say you do not meet one of those. The next question becomes, does my cell product meet all four criteria, again, outlined in FDA regulations that result in only a minimal level of FDA oversight? This means FDA is going to have some regulatory authority over your product, but it, does, it means that you do not need to get FDA approval in order to market your cell therapy product. If the answer is yes, and you meet all four of these criteria, then the cell product is going to be, as I noted, subject to just what I call a minimal uh, level of FDA oversight. But if the answer is no, and you get to this point in the decision tree, then what you need to do is submit an application to FDA for approval of that cell therapy product. So Barbara, um, this is actually a really great slide. I love the decision tree. Can you talk a little bit more about the exceptions and the criteria that you had mentioned in your slide uh, about minimal FDA oversight? Like how will a company know um, and what are the criteria and exceptions that have to be met? For them to, to have a product that you know is subject to FDA regulation but not approval. Yeah, yeah, good question. Well, um, what I what I've done here is on this slide. So I've I've outlined in a little more detail what some of these exceptions and criteria are. Now, recognizing that uh, we have limited time today, 
I won't be able to go into detail um, about each and every one of these points, but let's start on the exceptions bucket. So I've listed here six, the six exceptions from the regulations boiled down into um, more usable language. The one that I bolded, which is the second one, the same surgical procedure, I want to point this one out specifically because it is one that has caused a lot of difficulty, both for FDA and for industry and even medical practitioners. So according to this exception in FDA's regulation, which has been further clarified through guidance documents that FDA has, you are not subject to FDA oversight, if you take cells out of a person and you implant, quote, such HCTPs into the same person in the same surgical procedure. Well, the same person in the same surgical procedure isn't too, too much of a difficulty. The problem becomes is a lot of people have questioned, what does it mean to take such HCTPs out of someone? and then put them back into the same person. Isn't that just the practice of medicine? Well, FDA has clearly said that it does not regulate the practice of medicine. The issue FDA is concerned with is if you take those cells out of someone and you do too many um, manipulations or, or uh, processes with those cells, suddenly those cells are not the same thing anymore. You may have introduced um, an, uh, an agent that could cause communicable disease, for instance. So it's meant to be a narrow exception, and it means that you can't do much at all with those cells. They're just coming out of one place, going into another place in the same person. That has been used a couple times as a defense by different companies saying, all we're doing is the same surgical procedure. We are not subject to oversight. But Again, it's a narrow exception and FDA has um, fought back, if you will, vigorously against people who have claimed that exception. Now, as far as your question about the, the moderate level or the, uh, uh, the middle category of cells and regulation. So again, I noted that there are four criteria you have to meet and I've listed those here. Um, Again, the first two in this case that are bolded are the ones that have caused the most difficulty over time. So minimal manipulation, that has been fraught with a lot of um, difficulty. And in general, what FDA means by minimal manipulation is that you are not going to expand the cells, but you're, you're allowed to do certain limited procedures, if you will, with the cells. The question is, where is that line drawn? And that's where the difficulty lies. The intended for homologous use can also be very tricky because it means that the cell in, in the recipient has to have the same function that it had in the donor. What it um, does not mean is that you have to have it transplanted into the same location. So just because it may have come from adipose tissue, it doesn't have to necessarily go back into the same place in the recipient, but it has to serve a similar function. So again, these lines are rather blurry. FDA's tried to clarify them, but this again is where some of the, the difficulty in assessing this lies. But if you're in this bucket, you do need to register the place you make these cells, list them with FDA, and then comply with the appropriate FDA regulations. If you don't meet either of these buckets uh, or categories, then you move to the final bucket, meaning FDA approval is required. Uh, these represent cells that pose potentially the highest risk to the recipient. And cells are interesting. They're regulated both as drugs and biologics. But the important point is that you only need to have one application be approved. In other words, you don't need both a drug and a biologic application. Typically, cells are regulated as biologics, and uh, we will be talking about that in a bit more detail in a moment. Um, so, you know, it sounds like uh a little bit of a complicated um, process, you know, even though you've boiled it down very simply in these um, um, 
basic criteria for the decision tree. Um, you know, are there any sort of like small business guidances or things like that from the FDA that a company who's looking to get into this space can review for a little bit more color um, about these um, you know, decision trees? And then also what happens if a company gets it wrong? What if they, they decide that they're not regulated or they're subject to not subject to oversight and FDA comes and disagrees with them? Like, what are the consequences of that? Yeah, uh, two, two good questions. So um, as to your first question about more um, guidance, um, yeah, it's important to remember that, you know, the statute makes broad statements. The regulations offer some uh, additional detail, um, but a lot of this information comes from guidance documents, as I mentioned. And in 2017, FDA uh, updated or published brand new guidance documents that kind of covered this entire scope. So they have one that's specifically de devoted to what is the same surrogate procedure and what is specifically meant by minimal manipulation or homologous use. So, <clears throat> so FDA has recognized that these are things that need more clarity. So I would point people towards uh, those guidance documents. However, even then, I will admit as a practitioner, I read them and they're chock full of examples, but every situation with cells is so unique that um, it is tricky. And I mean, to your second point, um, there are, um, you know, you can be subject to enforcement um, activities, which, um, you know, can uh, pose its own difficulty. Um, let's see. Just trying to advance my slide. There we go. So this brings us directly to great lead into the second reason why I think it's very important to have a regulatory plan. And that's to avoid enforcement actions because FDA has not been quiet in this area. Uh, again, pointing to the importance of making this initial determination about your regulation. So some examples of FDA enforcement actions. And this is just a, a snapshot. There are, of course, other mechanisms that FDA has at its disposal. But a lot of these things can, uh, violations can result first in the issuance of a letter. Now that letter can take different formats. It can be a warning letter, which represents uh, perhaps a more serious or ongoing violation of one of FDA statutes or regulations. But it can also be something called an untitled letter, not a, not a very great name for it, but that is literally what FDA calls it. The Center for Biologics at FDA um, has this unique mechanism that's just limited to biologics and cells fall in that category. So FDA may, for instance, identify that there are some compliance issues with a company, but they don't rise to the severity uh, or the level of requiring a warning letter. So this is a little bit um, of a lesser, I, I, it's important, but it's one could say it's a, a lesser category than a warning letter. There's also things called, FDA calls reminder letters. And I've also seen letters sent out that are letters to cease manufacturing. So if something is rising to the level of posing a public health risk, FDA can send a letter demanding that a company perhaps recall uh, a cell product or that um, they destroy product that they have already made. So, you know, these all reflect, I guess, different levels of severity. Now, most important is if there's litigation. And in recent years, FDA and the Department of Justice have brought several lawsuits against stem cell therapy companies uh, one that some people may be aware of, there's one in California, but there's also the U.S. stem cell case in the state of Florida, where the clinic argued that it was, that it fell, it felt that it fell within the same surgical procedure exception, but FDA disagreed and the court agreed with FDA that in fact the company or the, the clinic was manipulating those cells in such a manner that they created a brand new product that FDA needed to regulate. So that those are some examples of things that FDA can do. You have to think also carefully about other groups as well, uh, federal and state 
groups like the Federal Trade Commission or individual state attorneys general. And in fact, just a few weeks ago, the FTC and the state of Georgia attorney general uh, teamed up to file a joint complaint against several Georgia-based stem cell clinics for marketing um, deceptive, uh, using deceptive advertising practices to market certain cell therapy treatments. So, um, so there's a number of, of things you need to keep in mind and ways that you can be at risk if you do get those decisions early on wrong. Um, so for the FDA enforcement actions, I mean, clearly a letter to stop manufacturing or even a lawsuit by DOJ, the impact of those is, you know, immediate and obvious, right? But what about these letters? What, what really happens? Like, what's the impact of, a war of getting a warning letter or an untitled letter? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I, I think one of, from a company and a business standpoint, um, obviously they indicate non-compliance with FDA. And the important thing to remember is these letters are made public. So there are databases on FDA's website of warning letters and untitled letters, um, even letters to cease manufacturing. So it, these can be made public and with that can come a variety of issues. Obviously it's uh, for anyone who's looking, it's a, a, a warning of its own um, to possible customers or clients or business partners um, also to investors, you know, FDA will sometimes post a company's response to a warning letter and indicate that the matter has been closed out and the company has fixed their problems. But I've also seen instances where those response letters don't get posted. So you could have a warning letter posted, but your response is not posted and it kind of leaves an incomplete picture, if you will for uh, anyone who stumbles upon that or, or is looking for information on your company. So I think that's one of the, um, the biggest concerns I would have with getting one of these warning letters. And of course, if you get a warning letter and you continue, for instance, to ignore or not correct, then you start bringing on the possibility of litigation. So, you know, these letters are, are serve as reminders that worse things could happen if you if you don't make the necessary corrections. And but just to get back to my initial question about you know what happens if a company is doing their best to try to figure things out and they get it wrong, um, you know, what do you think would be the first first communication from FDA? Would they get like a call? Would they get an untitled letter? Uh, or are the warning untitled reminder letters, these types of things, you know, several steps down the road when a company has like continued to be non-compliant. But a company that's just trying their best probably won't get one of these things. Is that correct? Yeah, you know, I, and I don't know that there's, you know, a playbook, if you will, for FDA. What I've seen is different things happen. Um, untitled letters, for instance, can be sent, and these can be sent quite easily. FDA sometimes will just take a look at company websites. They just literally, I think, start looking and seeing what people are saying about the product or the services they offer. So an untitled letter, for instance, could result even without getting a bad inspection, let's say. And maybe the company gets that letter and then they correct their, um, their errors um, in FDA's eyes and then they never get another letter. Um, sometimes you could have an untitled letter followed by a reminder letter followed by a warning letter. So sometimes these things build on top of each other. And um, I think a lot depends on the product, the situation, the companies involved, and frankly, the efforts they've made to correct any problems. So yeah, there is sort of a hierarchy. I mean, companies won't go to litigation or I should say the government won't pursue litigation until it's a fairly egregious matter and companies have ignored these, um, these historical warning levels or other levels. So. All right, so with that background in mind, kind of the categorization and some of the risks involved, let's get more granular about some cell product approval requirements. Which brings me to my third reason why I think it's very important that companies have an FDA regulatory plan, and that's to think both short-term and to think long-term. And what do I mean by that? Well, 
what I've tried to do on this slide is give just a very brief capsule uh, overview of the approval process. Now, any of these could be expanded greatly, but generally speaking, uh, a cell therapy program is gonna start with preclinical testing. Then once you're at the appropriate point, you're going to submit an IND to FDA to be able to begin your clinical testing. That clinical testing then uh, proceeds through a number of phases. You submit your application. And then importantly, there are a number of post-approval activities that um, sponsors do need to keep in mind that they have to comply with. So approval does not mean the end of the road. In some respects, and we'll talk about this, it can be the beginning of the road and the beginning of the end. Um, so it's important to think short and long-term because in the short term, you've got these preclinical testing needs, but down the line, you need to think this, if I'm going to commercialize it, I'm going to need to submit a full marketing application. So I need to be thinking early about what my end game is. And as I've noted with the arrow on the side of the screen, one important thing to remember throughout this development program is that you have to meet certain testing and study standards throughout, okay? These testing and study standards apply right from the beginning, from the preclinical testing point, of course, all the way through the human clinical testing. So I'm going to now, in, in the next few slides, just offer some comments on each one of these stages. The important thing with preclinical testing, I think, to remember is that a lot of this framework for preclinical testing was first established for drugs, for small molecules. Obviously, biologics, whether they're cells or gene therapy, proteins, vaccines, biologics encompasses a very broad uh, category of products. So what the preclinical testing requirements look like in practice versus on paper is going to be quite different depending on a, a number of things. And in the cell therapy space, your preclinical testing or all of the work that you do before you get to humans is going to be shaped by a number of things. And I've only listed a few of them here in the first point. So your plan though is going to be shaped by the types of cells you're using. Are they terminally differentiated already? Or are they, um, you know, are they stem cells that can become any other type of cell in the future? Your program's gonna be determined uh, by your proposed mechanism of action of your cells. Also by the disease and by the indication that you are pursuing, as well as the method of delivery, whether you're talking about uh, engraftment externally or you're talking about injection, for example. So with that, FDA has offered some key considerations to keep in mind, some of the, the high points that your preclinical testing program need to take into account. Again, this is only a small snapshot, and FDA has offered more uh, thoughts on this. But for our purposes, I think the key considerations are selecting the appropriate animal species, as well as selecting an appropriate disease model. How do these work in practice? Well, for a small molecule drug product, let's say, you may find that working with mice or rats is sufficient. However, if you're working on a cell therapy product for uh, osteoarthritis, let's just say, you may find that you need a larger animal species and a different model. So you may need to resort to pig, a pig model, for instance. Other things that are important to consider are toxicology and of course, tumorigenicity. When we start talking about cell therapy products more than uh, a small molecule drug, we need to think about what happens to those cells and is there any potential for the formation of tumors. Part and parcel with that is the survival and engraftment. So we need to think about for cells, what is the percentage of cells we expect to remain uh, alive upon delivery and shortly thereafter? And how are they gonna be distributed? Are they intended to stay local or are these cells going to end up in other places of the body that we may or may not expect? 
Also related to that is how the cells are going to differentiate and integrate, which again, dictated in part by the type of cells you use. And then finally, dose selection. And this is one that I have found time and again to be critical for FDA, because what you need to do is to present your rationale for why you're starting with, for example, 10 million cells as a dose, and how you're going to prove that 10 million is the right dosage. And this is where I've seen companies stumble on occasion. Now, obviously preclinical testing encompasses laboratory work and encompasses animal studies. In some cases, you may think about having a proof of concept study in animals before you get to what FDA calls the definitive preclinical study. Now, FDA has gone on to say that if at all possible, you should try to use the same cell product in your definitive preclinical study that you're going to use in your human studies. And the reason for that is because FDA wants to know that the studies you did in your definitive preclinical animal study is translatable and is usable as a means of showing, yes, it is going to be safe to go into humans. So if you make too many differences to your product before that, then it becomes difficult for FDA to rely on your early studies. And of course, complying with current good laboratory practice is important as you go through your preclinical testing. Now, I add here the caveat when possible, because FDA has offered that um, there may be occasions when a typical CGLP laboratory is not equipped for certain animal handling, let's say, that would <clears throat> otherwise um, need to meet GLP requirements. So again, FDA recognizes that GLP is important, but has offered some flexibility when it comes to the testing of cell therapies in animals. Um, Barbara, you mentioned that um, these key considerations, these were you know, eight of the ones that you thought were the most important, but that FDA had others. Um, where, where can a company that's you know, getting into this space find these considerations and a discussion explanation of them? Yeah, that, that's a good question. So as I noted, the regulations, they cover some of these things. However, the real, um, the real uh, details of all of this, uh, there, are, there are guidance documents. And I did reference uh, one in particular on preclinical studies for cell therapies. It's a few years old now but I think a lot of the principles still remain the same. So I would recommend people check out uh, the FDA guidance documents and I'm happy to point someone in, in the appropriate direction um, either later during a Q&A or afterwards offline. A good question. Okay, so once you have done your preclinical testing, of course, the next step here in the US is to submit an IND or an investigation only drug application. And this application outlines all of the prior experience that you've had with this product. So it will include your in vitro data, your animal pharmacology, toxicology, and all the other types of animal data you've gathered. But it also will include references to human use, if any. Um, perhaps other studies that were done in the US with the same cell product, or if it's approved abroad outside of the US, FDA would want to see information and data about its use outside of the US. A very critical point for cell therapy products is manufacturing information, what we call the chemistry manufacturing and controls. You may have heard of the phrase, the product is the process. In this case, for cell therapies, that is really true because as we know, how cells are treated, what their growth media is, how many times they're expanded, the scale up uh, issues that can arise, those can all ultimately affect the identity of the cells and therefore the identity of the product. And so having a, a very robust uh, information section on how you are manufacturing your cells is going to be important for an IMD. And then of course, the other critical part of the IND is the proposed human study, because at this point you're asking FDA for its authorization to move forward with human studies. So you're going to lay out your protocol, 
um, the investigators brochure and the qualifications of those investigators that you have selected. So here what I've done is um, very briefly, and I know some of you may be very well aware of the different phases of clinical testing, but I wanted to include this uh, to be comprehensive and to raise a few extra points. So again, as with preclinical testing, when it comes to clinical testing for cell therapy products, it's important to adapt some of the concepts that have arisen for small molecule drugs into this cell therapy space. So certain things might look a bit different. But overall, I mean, a phase one study we know is a small study that usually occurs in healthy subjects where you're getting information about safety and the tolerability. And you may start to get some inklings of how well or how uh, effective the cell product is. But that's not the overall goal of a phase one. The phase one is also designed to look at the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of that product. Again, these are concepts that arose first in the small molecule drug space. And FDA itself has said that things like absorption and distribution and the like are concepts that may or may not, depending on the cell and the situation, translate. Um, you may not talk about um, absorption of a cell product, but there's still the, the underlying um, I guess I would say the essence of what these things are meant to accomplish still apply. So I couldn't go into extraordinary detail here, but again, that's where I think meeting with FDA is important because you're going to get FDA's insight into what does pharmacokinetics or pharmacodynamics look like for me, my cells, and my situation. Phases two and three, of course, are a scale up. And so now you're doing larger and larger studies in affected individuals. And you're gaining more effectiveness information, more safety information. And by the end, you're going to be able to identify the overall risk benefit profile for this particular cell therapy product. One thing I wanna go back to mention in phase one is that this is where the dose ranging and escalation is very important. So where you will wanna think about building into your first protocol, um, the chance to identify different doses and the, um, the safety limits of what you see with those doses. So once you get through all of that, <laughs> the next step is to submit your application. This again is just frankly a snapshot of um, the different uh, elements of a BLA. And it's not entirely comprehensive because there are a lot of sub pieces, if you will. But of course, you're going to include everything you've already learned about your cell product. Uh, full description of the manufacturing. Again, manufacturing should be thought of as one of the very critical pieces here. Um, looking at product samples, uh, lot testing and the like. So, um, so these are all very important parts. In terms of post-approval activities, there's going to be a number of things that people need to remember. So once your product is on the market, you may still have certain post-market requirements. So for instance, these are things that are legally required uh, after a product is approved. So if a company gets accelerated approval, for instance, these might be based on surrogate endpoints, but FDA will expect additional studies after it has gone to market so that that accelerated approval can be converted to a full FDA product approval. Deferred pediatric studies. Um, there are laws here in the US that require certain new entities to have done, uh, uh, have completed pediatric studies. These can sometimes be waived and sometimes they can be deferred, but that means they still need to be done after marketing begins. Also, there may be instances when a new safety signal or a serious risk arises. And in that case, then the um, sponsor is going to need to do studies after the fact, after approval to really investigate those uh, safety issues. There are also post-marketing commitments. These are things that are not legally required, but that FDA and the sponsor have nonetheless agreed to 
prior to approval that the sponsor will finish after approval. And then there's a number of routine DLA reporting requirements as well. Uh, and what are some of those DLA reporting requirements? Sure. So there's 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 quite a number of them. So and I won't go into all of them, but for example, there can be um, required reports of serious and unexpected adverse events. Those need to be submitted 15 days, uh, it, it, within 15 days of learning of them. There are other adverse event reporting requirements that are initially quarterly, and then they become annual after your product's been on the market for a while. Of course, if any of your studies, uh, your PMRs or PMCs are completed, you have to report those. And if you think you're going into a, a drug shortage situation, like you anticipate a manufacturing problem, you also need to let FDA know about that as well. So there's actually a wide variety of things um, that people need to keep in mind once their product is approved. Okay, finally in this section, as far as testing and study standards, as I noted earlier, really there's two goals um, in doing uh, appropriate testing. And that's one, to protect human subjects, and two, it's to ensure the integrity of clinical trials. So that's why we have things in place like informed consent, uh, institutional review board oversight. Also, it's important, and what FDA requires is that clinical investigators who may have financial ties or a financial stake in a company whose product it's testing, they have to disclose those to FDA. And then if you are receiving federal funding here in the US, like from the Department of Health and Human Services, NIH, any of those uh, entities, then you will have to think about some additional human subject protections and reporting requirements that are um, mandated as well. And then finally, I just wanted to note that whoever you are in this uh, uh, drug development chain, whether it's a sponsor, an investigator, or a CRO, everybody has responsibilities to make sure that these sorts of uh, testing and study standards are met. So if you're a sponsor, of course, you can use a CRO to, uh, to undertake certain functions, but you cannot just simply contract away every responsibility you have. You are still going to be responsible for the overall oversight of your um, development program. So now let's, let's transition into um, what I think are some of the important ways to avoid some common development pitfalls. This brings me to the fourth reason for having a regulatory plan. And that's first of all, so that you can prepare a solid preclinical study plan. And what do I mean by that? Well, some of the common pitfalls for preclinical studies could be not selecting the appropriate animal model, or the appropriate starting dose, um, not considering the impact of the route of administration that your cell product may have, uh, or you don't sufficiently think through the post-administration fate of the cells. Are they, where are the cells ending up actually in the body? Or to the extent possible, you're not following current good laboratory practices. So these are all early stumbling blocks that can occur. And so how can a company, um, you know, avoid, you know, stumbling over these blocks, like you mentioned, and what would be the consequences if they did? Yeah, good, good question. I think one of the key ways to do this is to take advantage of meeting with FDA. So FDA offers a couple of different meeting programs. Um, if you're at the very early uh, preclinical study stage and you need assistance or feedback on your preclinical program, whether it be looking at doses in animals, which animal species to use, or things at that very early stage, FDA has something called interact meetings. It's a much longer acronym for a much longer phrase, but I'll leave it at that. It's called interact. And these are for very early stage uh, companies to get uh, non-binding FDA feedback. If you're further along and you are at the IND or pre-IND stage, then a pre-IND meeting is, can be very important. This is where you're presenting all your animal and in vitro data, and you're presenting your, your first shot at a, a clinical protocol. 
And so that would be the appropriate time to get FDA feedback on those. So I also think just taking advantage and heeding FDA's advice is important. Um, it's one thing to go and meet with them, but it's another, if they say something you don't want to hear, like we would like another animal study, that you actually listen and take that advice into account. So I think those are those are good ways to avoid some of these early traps. And Barbara, I'm sorry, before you move on to the next one, um, we did get a question in, um, and I'm gonna read it to you. Are there differences in clinical trial enrollment expectations for cellular therapy products relative to small molecules? Are a number of subjects similar to that needed for small molecules generally needed for cellular therapy products at each stage of development or phase of development? Yeah, great, great question on, on the study size. Yeah, I mean, typically, well, for, for a phase one, you know, you might have a couple, you might have two dozen healthy subjects, for instance, and then usually it can go up into to the hundreds or thousands, depending for a traditional small molecule. Now, the thing is, there haven't been a lot of cell therapies approved yet by FDA. Uh, some have been approved um, that are like uh, cord blood derived, but in terms of just, let's say a cell therapy product for um, you know, joint pain, there, there, there is not yet a lot that is FDA approved to be able to draw on that as an experience um, and to benchmark that for other companies. So I would say that again, the most appropriate thing is that as you're talking to FDA, first at the pre-IND meeting, and then as you go through your development program, um, there's other opportunities later on to, of course, meet with FDA, that you set expectations. I think the size is going to be dictated largely by um, the indication and the type of cells and all of those things that we talked about already uh, briefly. And, um, you know, hopefully that starts to set the, 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 the framework. I'd be happy to, you know, chat more offline and, and try to get a bit more granular, uh, particularly if you have a specific uh, situation in mind. But great, great audience question. So that brings us to the, the next to last reason to have a regulatory plan, and that's to prepare a solid clinical study plan. So again, some of the, and this builds into um, what uh, actually our, our audience member just asked. When it comes to clinical studies, it's important to remember some of the pitfalls can include, you may not identify appropriate inclusion or exclusion criteria. Um, a, a, an inability to scale up your manufacturing with your CMO. This is a huge one at this stage. Because as you go from state, uh, phase two to phase three studies, for instance, you need to have enough starting material to be able to accommodate the number of subjects that you're gonna have. Another problem could be that I've seen happen is where companies continue to work off of a master or a working cell bank, but sometimes unbeknownst to uh, uh, a company, the characteristics of the cells may have changed and therefore it's important to keep checking your cells and make sure their identity has remained stable. You could make the error of not studying your um, subjects long enough to understand the fate of the cells. Or I think this actually, this last point dovetails nicely with the audience question about underpowered studies. In this area, you know, there's always going to be the statisticians at FDA who want to know that you have enrolled enough people to have a statistically significant result. Now, we do know that orphan products for very rare diseases, obviously those clinical trial sizes are going to be much smaller. So I think part of the issue is what are you looking to study? Uh, what is the indication? And if it's a rare, rare disease that you're getting a cell therapy approved for, obviously that's gonna have a lot fewer subjects it's just, it still needs to be powered correctly. So that's where the interaction with FDA comes in. Um, and Barbara, we have another question. Um, are the cellular therapies for cancer indications tested in healthy subjects? Ah, good, good question. So a lot of these are, um, I think what we're referring to is there are, um, it's basically a combination of gene therapies, 
and cell therapies together. So it might be identifying um, a new, um, it might be doing a, an insert uh, of a genetic, uh, a gene therapy into a cell and then implanting the cell. So um, yeah, when it, comes, when it comes to healthy subjects there, yeah, that's, that's obviously gonna be trickier because now you're getting into ethical principles and can you actually do that with healthy people? I think the best way that I could think of it is um, that might be a situation where, and I hate to fall back on this, but it's so dependent, where you could, you could make the case that we need to do additional animal studies. Um, and maybe you have some sort of a knockout gene model, for instance, in, um, in pigs, just to pick a species. Um, and do more studies that way, because I think obviously the sponsor and FDA are going to have concerns in that case about doing something in a healthy individual. I can't say for sure that FDA would say no, we wouldn't expect it, but I think that's a great time to have a, a discussion with FDA about bolstering your preclinical uh, package to perhaps account for some of those, some of those issues that you would otherwise test in humans. So finally, I think it's important to think strategically. And that's what I think is the final reason. And that's, um, you know, there's pitfalls when it comes to regulation. You may decide not to meet with FDA. I've already talked about the opportunities are there, which I think are critical to take advantage of. Um, assuming FDA is going to design your study for you, that's, that's a definite uh, regulatory pitfall. FDA is there to give feedback, but FDA is not going to say, um, this is what your study design should absolutely be. So it's important to go to FDA with your own thoughts and your own study design first. Not listening or not incorporating what you hear from FDA, I think, are two that are important, which I mentioned briefly before. Because on a basic level, FDA has seen all the cards. They've seen all the cell therapies that have come through and have gotten to um, the stage that your program is at. And so they are clearly going to ask for additional information or offer advice based on their breadth of what they've seen. Whereas you may have only seen your own program. So that's why it's important to listen and to really think about how you take that feedback back to your development program. Also not thinking about FDA exclusivity or expedited review issues, that can be a problem too. Um, and I'll just in the interest of time, just offer that for exclusivity, you know, if you're an orphan product, there are ways to get additional time during which FDA would not approve the identical product. And for expedited review, there's things like the RMAP designation or breakthrough therapy designation, a number of things that can be layered on top of each other that may offer you uh, faster meetings with FDA or that may give you access to more senior level officials reviewing your product. So these are all important things to keep in mind from a regulatory point of view. And Barbara, we have an audience question came in. What are the regulatory requirements for personalized cell therapy products? Ah, so personalized. So yeah, that, that might be one that, that I would be more than happy to take offline. Um, you know, again, I could see all the way back. Now, if we're talking the same surgical procedure way back at the beginning of what we started with, that's, I mean, that's one thing. If, if uh, a clinic can, can definitively be sure that it fits within that category. Um, but if you're talking about just, um, you know, culturing your own cells and growing those, yeah, I mean, uh, there are obviously, um, there are going to be different considerations. You're going to be less concerned about perhaps um, immunogenicity, uh, rejection issues. I think um, I, I would love to talk more about that. I, I know we're getting close to our hour and um, I'd be more than happy to follow up after with that one. So wrapping up in terms of the importance of a regulatory plan, these just capture the six uh, topics that I've brought up throughout the um, discussion today. Um, you know, 
I, I think that there are clear reasons why you should be prepared. I will offer, um, again, in the interest of time, that I think number six is actually the most important because thinking strategically, which is a term people use all the time, but that really encompasses one through five here. It means thinking about early on and then adjusting as you go. You know, what are your uh, obligations going to look like? What are you going to study? Um, and how do you execute on that? I think that's really at bottom what thinking strategically means. Um, there's a question related to number two, enforcement action. Yes. If a company receives a warning letter or untitled letter, are they obligated to inform any existing partners or collaborators? Or do they only need to do that if their response is not sufficient and FDA is going to pursue further? Well, in terms of notifying other um, uh, partners that you may have, I mean, a lot of that's going to be left to contract, frankly, and your relationship with them. Um, as I mentioned, these warning letters do become public at some point. I can't say that they're published immediately, but FDA is fairly active in keeping its warning letter database up to date. So, you know, that, again, thinking strategically, I would think you may want to broach that with your partner earlier rather than later because it's possible they would not find out. But if they're doing their own due diligence, um, uh, you know, they could find out and then wonder why you didn't disclose that to them. So, um, so hopefully so that there's no, so there's no like FDA law requirement that you notify your, you know, your collaborators, but just you probably in your agreement with them have some sort of provision that talks about compliance with FDA regula regulations and who's going to address what and things like that, right? Exactly. Yes. Yes. I mean, the, the warning letters between you and FDA and, um, you know, it's making sure you stay in compliance as a company and what you do with that information that's going to be guided more by good business practices and your relationships with, with your partners. Absolutely. Okay. So a lot of reasons why people say they don't want to develop a regulatory plan. I'm too small. It's too early. I don't have the budget. No one's asked me. I'm just dedicated to my science right now. But what I hope that I've been able to demonstrate is that actually this is a pretty complex area. Um, we've only scraped the surface as is clear from the questions that have arisen. And there are enforcement risks along the way. So I can also say with confidence, even if you hadn't had this arise yet, that investors are going to ask you at some point for your regulatory plan. They wanna know that you've thought about exclusivity they want to know you thought about whether you qualify for an expedited review pathway. They, of course, want to know about your patent protection. Um, they want, they're going to want to know, okay, what does your preclinical plan look like? Have you gotten FDA feedback on your dosing schedule? All of those things will become important at some point. So I think it's critical to prepare now. Your plan is going to co-evolve with your science, so it's not meant to be static. It's just meant you to get on track and, and think and plan strategically. So with that, um, I'd be happy to take another question. I know we've been able to get questions in during this, and that's been wonderful. Um, otherwise, um, I will turn it back to uh, facilitate for any final wrap up. Yeah, I think unfortunately that is all we have time for for this session. Um, but I do apologize if we did not get a chance to address your questions. Uh, we will try and address them offline if you would like to send them in to us. Um, just before we wrap up, I would just like to take a second to thank Barbara and Tina for their insights, moderation and answers to our questions. Um, as always, you can access this webinar on demand via the Facilitate website, along with many more of our previous webinars. You should receive an email as soon as the recording is available. Until next time, thank you for joining us today and goodbye. Thank you.